So they still wheel him in to every board meeting of the university. And they sign him in. He's attending. And by the way, um, is it really him? It's his real body with a wax head, because oh. his real head looks like that. Yeah. Now, glass eyes and everything. And that's that's I believe sitting at the the feet of the chair. So, oh. so I don't know if you could see it in this picture down here. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So the the head on the so all the of them still attend, but they wanted to make him more visually appealing. Yeah, the perhaps the slather was terrible. Yeah, the the face yeah, made out of wax looks. Yeah. Out, I know that's like some crypt creeper stuff. It's just Ooh. wow. Oh, Does that still happen? At some level, you have to be like, you know, yeah, you might still want this as well, but like. One of my students that graduated with a BA in philosophy from here went and actually posted a picture, a selfie with him with Jeremy Bentham in that spot. So that was pretty cool for him standing next to. That's creepy. That's very really creepy. Yeah. I still want to see the head though. He really loved those board meetings, or did he hate them? Well, I've seen it, you know, sitting here, but I don't know. Him There's like something here. It's almost like now you have to deal with my corpse for, the, for all the rest of the time. But there's like some board meeting, like a vote, just like okay, we're voting him out for the board. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think. Um, I don't think he's a voting member. Well, <laughs> Maybe he abstains. Yeah, like, no, no, but like abstains. Abstain. Six hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> in the tower, they keep a flock a of ravens. You know, they keep what in the tower? Ravens. There's there's some kind of saying that you know that the kingdom will collapse if the ravens leave the tower. So they keep them there. They have. They do. It's not I'm not making this up. The British make it up. <laughs> Of that sort. But, oh, I think I turned that back on, didn't I? Yes. I did. Okay. So, um, bring up, before talking about John Stuart Mill, talk about Jeremy Bentham, because uh, John Stuart Mill and his father were followers of Jeremy Bentham. In fact, they're friends. So, Jeremy comes to the house, and this was a frequent dinner guest, and so on. And Jeremy Bentham is the founder of 
utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. I think I've already mentioned that our philosophy as Americans is supposed to be called pragmatism. Pragmatism is just an American form of utilitarianism, in a manner of speaking. There are some differences, but in fact, there, there's not a commonality among all pragmatists or all utilitarians. There's rule utilitarians, for example. Uh, but Jeremy Bentham uh, argued that that following Thomas Hobbes. Um, John Locke was a Christian, um, but even so, uh, we might call him a deist as opposed to an official uh, 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 follower of, of uh, the Episcopal Church. Um, but the, um, the idea of, of Thomas Hobbes that what motivates the machine that is the human body is increasing pleasure and decreasing pain, right? Avoidance of pain. Um, uh, Jeremy Bentham, following along uh, with that uh, set of beliefs, argues that the good is the greatest good of the greatest number. That's referred to as the principle of utility. property in any object whereby it tends to produce benefit, advantage, pleasure, good, or happiness, or to prevent the happening of mischief, pain, evil, or unhappiness to the party whose interest is concerned. So the greatest good for the greatest number. And by that is meant uh, pleasure itself. Um, so he invented what's referred to as the hedonist calculus hedonistic calculus. Um, a hedon is an individual unit of pleasure. So the idea is that you can literally calculate how much pleasure something, some activity or whatever would give you. you know, and you know, well, and this is how much pain uh, it would give you. So you could calculate and figure out, aha, so we ought to do this. You might not normally, of course, sit down and calculate every decision that way. Uh, but basically, he would argue uh, that your body is kind of trying to do that. You know, that we're trying to decide uh, what's going to be the best you know, result. You know, I think of, you know, if I'm uh, going to the state fair you know, during the summer, you know, the end of the summer, uh, and I realize, wow, you know, if we go to the state fair, you know, all my kids will have 25 hedons of pleasure. You know, my wife will have 50 hedons of pleasure. She's an adult, so she has much more pleasure from going to the fair. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to enjoy some aspect of it, so I'll figure I'll have 25 hedons of pleasure by going to the fair. The thing is, staying home and sitting out on the back deck and reading Hegel would probably give me a hundred hedons of pleasure <laughs> instead. Uh, but when you add up all the kids and my wife's pleasure and my pleasure of staying home, it works out so that, oh, I've got to take them to the fair. Right? You know, that's how I count. You know, so you've got to calculate, you know, the best deal, you know, for the greatest number, right? You know, so... <clears throat> Plus, of course, that means that four more tickets or six more tickets will be purchased at the fair, you know, which would help, you know, elevate the, the pleasure of the folks at the fair, you know, because they always count how many people came this year, et cetera. You're right. So, so you've got to count, you know, all these elements to try to figure out what the best choice is. And the best choice, uh, any moral uh, choice would be, you know, how much pleasure it gives to the greatest number, uh, etc. So the fundamental axiom of his philosophy is the principle that it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. Now, there are interesting problems associated with this utilitarian point of view. Um, it's 
consequentialist. Consequentialist. That means the consequences of the action is what you're counting, right? Uh, so the interesting thing then is that you could actually do some what we would consider evil things for the greater good. Ooh, does that sound like a movie to you? Anybody? I'll give you my crackers if you figure out which movie that's. Say it again. Justifying evil things. For the greater good. I still get to keep my crackers. That's not the one. Is it Count of Monte Cristo? No. The, um, the movie I'm thinking of is The Crimes of Grindelwald. Oh, okay. I still haven't seen that. Maybe we need a trailer again. One story? Is that a narrative? Can you watch that again? I thought it was YouTube. Can I just watch that again? I thought it was YouTube. That's clearly all these people making up things. <laughs> 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 it's the trouble with YouTube videos. I make up. Do you make up? Do you make up? Do you make up? That really is Eddie Redmayne. And that really, this, so this is. So rich and fast, from Harry Potter to Fantastic Beasts, there are so many connections between characters and storylines, past and present, and so many secrets yet to be revealed. So in this movie, we are exploring the rise of the first Dark Lord, Gellert Grindelwald. Notice that was the same wand in each of those places. Say anything about the greater good. <laughs> Shoot. Power. But that was, uh, that's the kind of the phrase that Voldemort used and Grindelwald used and all that sort of thing. So this is clearly a British thing that the Brits are all familiar with. Um, the, you know, the, the great the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, um, but now, what if you don't know what your greatest good is? Who does? Who knows what your greatest good is? Who knows? 
populists? Does President Trump know the greatest good? Who would? Uh, it's actually, uh, um, there's a, a British author, um, by Philip Kitcher, who's on my list. No one's picked him, though. Um, but one of his books is titled uh, Science in a Democratic Society. And the trouble with a democracy, as we can see going back, uh, tracing our, our philosophy, our political philosophy to Aristotle, uh, is that in a democracy, uh, the deme, the people, uh, can vote benefits for themselves and never pay for them. Uh, you know, this, it's easy to, to vote yourself benefits, but it's hard to decide who should pay for it and, and convince everybody, right? Uh, and so democracy tends to go bankrupt, which leads to chaos, which is the worst situation you could be in. So the Greeks typically feel that an aristocracy is a better form of government, or Hobbes, a monarchy, um, uh, and clearly with Locke what we see is an aristocracy led by a monarch, right? Uh, so the idea, of course, is that you need the wise, the elite, who understand things to make the decisions. If you leave things up to uh, the people, who are basically uneducated, and, and you know the the model we we certainly get uh, when we think about uh, a republic is this pyramid kind of thing, where you have you know the most educated, of course, at the top, uh, and you know various uh, uh, strands of folks, and you know the poor, uneducated, or worse, you know down at the bottom, tend to be the majority, right? So when you have uh, a, a democracy where everyone has the vote, then what you end up with is the majority ends up ruling instead of the more intelligent elite, right? Um, one of the things that, um, that Locke is concerned about and, and Mill is concerned about is the tyranny of the majority, right? Uh, so you don't want you, you don't want you know a populace because that means that you're going to have primarily the uneducated uh, voters uh, uh, outvoting the educated voters who know what's best. Philip Kitcher in this book argues that what a democracy in order to solve this kind of problem, what ought to uh, um, uh, be part of the structure of the democracy is to have the specialists, the scientists, who are the ones that understand a particular issue, do the uh, analyses of the problem, come up with the best solutions, possible solutions, and then present those solutions to the democracy for vote. But you wouldn't basically let the 